Welcome back to part two of regression basics. So we'll keep talking about logistic regression since that's again what you're going to be doing in your groups for your campus wellness assessment project. And I left the board the same as it was where we left off last time. So as a reminder, the logistic regression model, we're estimating the log odds of having the outcome that you're looking at. And we're doing that by using the same sort of linear equation that we used you know, in the, in the general um, description of the shape of the line and also the same that we used in linear regression. But again, for logistic regression, we have a categorical outcome and specifically we have a dichotomous or binary outcome. So just a yes, no variable. And the way that we estimate odds ratios, the way that we estimate this logistic regression model is really the this pi, as I have written here still, the pi represents the probability of the outcome. Um, so it's really estimating the probability of success, but by that we typically mean of having the outcome. So you wanna code your outcome. Usually the way we code it is kind of the negative outcome or the, the experience that we're most interested in understanding is coded as a one, and then not having that experience is coded as a zero in your data. So, as I said in the last video, if you have an outcome for your project that is not already two categories, you'll need to make it that way. And so make sure that the one represents the group that you're really interested in talking about, people who have some experience. So maybe people who experience anxiety or depression, people who do, um, who are classified as binge drinking, people who have used services on campus. So those would all be coded as a one and then people who haven't have used a service, aren't classified as binge drinking, um, you know, didn't get a flu vaccine, whatever it is, they're coded as zeros. So let's talk a little bit more about this slope variable, this beta one, because as I said last time, that is um, largely what we're interested in when we run this logistic regression model. So what we're really doing, and the reason it's called an odds ratio is because it's a relative measure. We're comparing two groups. We're comparing a group who has the exposure to a group who doesn't have the exposure or potentially groups who have different levels of exposure to each other. But I'm gonna kind of stick to that basic, just two category exposure to keep things a little bit more simple. So we'll imagine that both our outcome and our exposure are binary um, in this example or in the examples that I talk about. So. I mentioned last time the intercept is informative because it tells us what the <clears throat> odds of the outcome are for the group who has no exposure. So um, let's say uh, that our exposure of interest is whether or not students are parents or guardians of children under the age of 18. Um, so a one means they are a parent and zero means they're not a parent. So if we plug that in up here, I erased my X, but remember that, so these are the values of X, so this is our exposure. So we wanna know, does being a parent influence, and we'll say that our outcome is sleep. So let's imagine that we've made some um, dichotomous variable to indicate whether or not people get enough sleep, so I'll call it adequate sleep. And again, one means yes, that they get enough sleep. And zero means no, that they didn't get adequate sleep, or they got inadequate sleep. Okay, so those are our two variables. Our outcome is sleep, our exposure is parent status. So if we wanna know, do parents tend to get different amounts of sleep? Are they, have, do they have higher or lower likelihood of getting adequate sleep compared to students who aren't parents? Um, the way that we would calculate that is we could plug in a zero for our non-parent students and that would make this cancel out. So it cancels out the slope, right? It cancels out this value. And then the log odds of getting enough sleep for students who are not parents, who had a zero for X, 
we'd estimate just that it's just as this intercept value. And then for students who, uh, let's see, can you see this over here still, sort of? Let me turn it here just a little. Okay. So for, for students who are not parents, their estimate is just going to be um, their estimate of adequate sleep, the, the likelihood that they get enough sleep or the odds of them getting adequate sleep. It's just beta naught. It's just equal to the intercept. For students who are parents, x becomes 1. So their estimate of the log odds of getting enough sleep is beta naught plus beta 1. So you can see that we have these two different groups. So the log odds of getting adequate sleep for students who are parents is beta naught plus beta one, and the log odds of getting enough sleep, adequate sleep for students who aren't parents is beta naught. And if you look at the difference between those two, you can subtract one from the other. And of course the beta naughts cancel. And so relative to students who are not parents, students who are parents are beta one have beta one times the odds of getting adequate sleep. And so that's where we get our odds ratio from. So it's really comparing parents versus non-parents becomes beta one. And so when we run this model, the beta one value, the slope value of our equation is really telling us how much more or less likely are the exposed people to have the outcome compared to the unexposed people? And so this beta one is the focus of our um, interest in the outcome or in the result of the model, I should say. Beta one is what we're gonna focus on. And if we go back over here, um, you might notice I have a log odds here. And you may remember from earlier math classes the way to get rid of a log is to do what? Exponentiate it. So really, this equation, when we interpret it, we want to do the e to the log odd. So that will just give us the odds of y. Um, and we exponentiate the values on the other side as well. And so really, it's not beta 1 directly that we're looking at from this model, we look at the exponentiated beta one, and what that turns out to be is our odds ratio. So it tells us for parents compared to non-parents, for our exposed group compared to our unexposed group, what is the relative difference in the odds of the outcome? So this e to the beta one is what we call the odds ratio. And we abbreviate that as OR, OR for odds ratio. So the odds ratio is what I'm going to ask you to be reporting on, focusing on. This is going to be kind of the primary outcome of your group project. So you'll be talking about um, what are the chances, what are the odds of experiencing the outcome that we're looking at for the exposed group compared to the unexposed group. So again, in this example, this odds ratio would be telling us how much more or less likely is it that students get adequate sleep given that they're a parent compared to not being a parent. Um, so let me give you an example of that. Let's say we run this model and we get an odds ratio of 2, 2.0. 2.0 is our odds ratio. So I'm going to give you a minute to think about what do you think that that might mean in the context of this parent and adequate sleep example. So this odds ratio means that for students who are parents, so students who are exposed in this example, students who are parents 
have twice the odds, two times the odds, this is a 2.0, two times the odds of getting adequate sleep compared to students who are not parents. So this is a multiplier. This is a, because it's a relative difference, we're talking about how many times more or less likely one group is to have the outcome compared to the other group. So that's one important note about an odds ratio. It's not an absolute measure. It's not that they're, um, you know, two on a scale, on a measurement scale. We're talking about two times the um, odds of having, of getting enough sleep. So that is one thing um, to note about this, and we'll come back to that later, how this relative measure differs from absolute measures. So twice as likely to, or two times the odds, getting adequate sleep compared to non-parents, and that compared part is also critical. Um, it's not just you know compared to the whole population, it's compared to the unexposed group. So you're always comparing one value of x to another value of x. So it's important to make it really clear which two groups you're comparing. So here again, this would be saying the odds of getting adequate sleep are twice as high for students who are parents as for students who are not parents. If we get a relative risk of one, one means exactly the same odds in both groups because Again, if you think about the way that this is structured, the odds ratio is comparing one group to another. So that's essentially saying, if in order to get a value of one, the log odds of adequate sleep for parents would have to be the same as the log odds of adequate sleep for non-parents because we're effectively dividing these two values. We're doing a ratio of odds. It's an odds ratio. And so in order to get a value of one, they have to be exactly the same. Um, so I don't know what a reasonable number would be here to estimate the log odds, but if this were 0.3, then the other group would also have to be 0.3, and so that gives you an odds ratio of 1.0. So anytime you see an odds ratio of one, that means the, the risk of the outcome, excuse me, um, the odds of the outcome, the risk of the outcome is identical in both groups. So neither group has a higher or lower chance of odds of getting adequate sleep. So an odds ratio of one is kind of our, it's kind of like it's, it's the zero on an absolute scale. It means there's no difference between the groups. And then the further away you go from one, that means the stronger the association between the exposure and outcome. So my first example was an odds ratio of two and a doubling of the odds is actually pretty big. That would be a big, we consider that a pretty big odds ratio, two or higher. The weird thing about a relative scale like this is that the lowest possible value is a zero, but the highest possible value is infinity. So it's a very unbalanced, scale if you think about it. So if one is the midpoint of this scale, but it only goes from zero, so let's say one is here, so that means one means equal risk, but this goes out to infinity. So clearly, the if you are estimating your odds ratio in a way that the exposed group is the one you think will have a higher chance, then you know, there's a lot more, a lot wider range of values that that odds ratio could take on. If, however, your question is set up in a way that the exposed group actually has lower risk, um, so again, thinking back to the earlier example we used for the, the uh, linear regression, you know, physical activity, we would expect to reduce the risk of lots of outcomes. Um, let's say we're looking at heart disease as a binary dichotomous outcome. Um, so if you want to know if higher levels of physical activity are associated with lower risk of heart disease, you would actually expect to see an odds ratio less than one, because if it's less than one, that means the risk in the exposed group is lower than the risk in the unexposed group, because again, we're dividing the odds in the two. Um, so for example, if we calculated an odds ratio of 0.5 for that situation, 
we'd say that people who had high levels of physical activity were half as likely, 0.5 times as likely, um, or had 0.5 times the odds of developing cardiovascular disease compared to people who had low levels of physical activity. So 0.5 is, if you reversed it, that's the inverse of two. So that kind of gives you a sense, you know, two or larger is considered a strong association and likewise 0.5 or smaller, so 0.5 to zero, is also considered a strong association uh, because you're cutting the odds in half or doubling them. And that's equivalent things, it's just opposite sides of the scale. Um, so the reason that I mention this is that often I find it easier to interpret odds ratios if they are bigger than one. And I think readers tend to understand them a little bit more clearly if they're bigger than one. So if it's possible for you to set up your regression model so that the group that you expect to have more of the outcome, assuming the outcome is negative, um, then you could kind of set it up so that you get an odds ratio that's bigger than one, just by inverting who's a zero and who's a one in your um, classification in Stata. So I'll come back to that if that's not completely clear. And it's totally fine to have an odds ratio less than one. I just find that students get a little bit more tripped up with interpreting what it means. Um, and so that's why I'm recommending that if you can set it up so your odds ratio is bigger than one, it just might make it a little bit easier on you. But again, I'm happy to help if your group is having difficulty either coding it that way or interpreting an odds ratio less than one. But really, it doesn't matter what the odds ratio is because the interpretation is always the same. It's always that the odds for the exposed group is this many times the odds in the unexposed group. So again, if, if you get 0.5, you can say half as likely, 0.5 times as likely. Um, the other thing you can do if you like interpreting things in percentages, you can kind of move this decimal place over, multiply by 100, and you could say they're 50% as likely to have the outcome. Likewise, when we had the 2.0 as our odds ratio, saying somebody's twice as likely is equivalent to saying they're 200% as likely to have the outcome. So either interpreting an odds ratio as an X fold difference or X times difference between the two groups, it's also fine to convert that to a percentage and say X percent as likely. Hopefully that's clear. If not, just send me a message. So that's the basics of logistic regression. <clears throat> Again, the critical things here are to remember that you must have a dichotomous or binary outcome in order to re run a, regress a logistic regression model. Stata will tell you if you have selected something that is not dichotomous. Um, and I strongly recommend you code it as zero and one, where one is the outcome that you're really interested in talking about. Um, because by default, that's how Stata will estimate the outcome. It's gonna estimate the probability or the, the odds of, um, of having a one, of having the higher value um, when it gives you your output. And again, your X can have any number of categories that you want. It is a little bit more straightforward if it also only has two, but certainly not required. So up to you and your group. Um, and then again, the, the slope value, this beta one, is what becomes what gets exponentiated to become the odds ratio and the odds ratio is really what we are trying to estimate with all of this. One last note about um, the logistic regression model. As I said at the beginning of the last video, linear regression and t-tests are sort of similar and logistic regression and chi-square tests are sort of similar. So when you run this model, which is what we would call the crude model, you're basically just gonna, in Stata, you'll just be putting in your exposure and your outcome variable. Your p-value that you get from this logistic regression model should be pretty similar to what you got from your chi-square test. So sometimes they're identical, not always. There is a little bit of a difference in the underlying assumptions of a chi-square test and a logistic regression model, but usually the p-values are very similar. Um, because the assumptions, we're assuming a similar underlying distribution. They're both looking, they're both considering something with, uh, this is a, a, just a binomial 
uh, distribution here. So that's one thing to just be aware of. I'm gonna ask you as part of your assignment to run a crude model, which again, just means unadjusted. You're not putting anything else in it. You're just saying, give me a logistic regression model with my exposure and my outcome and see whether or not they're related. So you would expect that p-value to be similar to what you saw when you did a chi-score test. But the next step that I'm gonna ask you to do is the beauty of regression models is that they're flexible enough to add more than just one thing. So here I've, and so at this point, I've just written it as beta naught plus beta one times x one. But you can actually keep adding more and more x terms out here. All the way up to beta k, x k. And this is really, getting back to that idea of confounding that I introduced at the beginning of the first part of this um, session, which is that we're not just limited to looking at our exposure outcome relationship. We can account for other factors, other confounding variables that might be different between these two groups. And confounding really just means confusing. And that is all these other variables are doing because we wanna know, our question is, does this exposure influence this outcome? And that's our main question of interest. This is, so these are the variables that you as a group have come up with. You wanna know if one thing influences the other. Does sleep, does parent status impact sleep in my example? But the problem is that parents, students who are parents and students who aren't, are different in lots of other ways. It's not just sleep. It's not that they're similar, except that some of them happen to have children and some of them didn't. As we've already seen in earlier classes, we know that students who have children tend to be older than students who aren't. And we might think, well, sleep probably changes with age too. And so it might not be that it's the fact that you have kids in the house that's influencing your sleep. It might be that you're just older and sleep changes as we get older. And so that's the reason that we get this, um, significant relationship between parent status and sleep. And so accounting for confounding, adding these other variables out here in our regression model is what we can do to see, is it age that's making the difference or is it actually being a parent? And so that's, that's really what all these terms are. So this first X1 is gonna be your main exposure of interest. And then all the rest of these are what we would call confounding variables. So variables that would confuse the relationship that you're interested in looking at that might influence this odds ratio here, which is your primary focus. So the good news is this is pretty easy to do within Stata. And again, I'm gonna be posting a separate video to show you how to do all of this in Stata. Um, but you can just keep adding variable names after you've added your exposure name and status. So you just give state a list of all the variables you want on the right side of your equation, and it'll use those to estimate <clears throat> the log odds of having the outcome. So that's the good news. It's pretty easy to actually implement this. It's no different, really, whether you have just one exposure or if you have one exposure and 10 confounding variables. It's not technically any more challenging, really. The challenging part is deciding what other 10 variables you should actually put in your model. And um, there are different approaches to doing this. So one kind of category of approaches to identifying confounding variables, well, actually, before I get into that, let me back up one step. Because um, I've said that confounding means confusing. It's other variables that might be explaining the relationship that you're interested in looking at. But let me add one more piece to that. Uh, that might help some of you who are more uh, visual learners or thinkers about these kinds of things. So again, if I use my example of whether being a parent impacts sleep, kind of the traditional or a, a, a very um, basic, I guess, it's not the right word, but I'm having trouble thinking of the right word, but one way to think about confounding is to think about any variable that would be associated with both of these. So I used the example age before. So if we think 
that as you get older, you become more and more likely to become a parent. That's why I drew this line here. So age infl influences whether or not you are a parent. And if you can also draw a line from age to your outcome, so sleep, as I said, we might think that as you get older, your sleep changes. It doesn't really matter if we think it gets better or worse. We're just saying that age influences sleep. That this would be a confounder because it's associated with both the exposure and the outcome. And so that's one basic definition of what a confounder is. It's related to both of your variables of interest, and therefore it can confuse the relationship that you're interested in. Because again, this is, this is really what we want to know here. Does being a parent influence your sleep? But age kind of interferes with that because we think age is associated with both things, both being a parent and getting enough sleep. And that definition actually works, but the complication comes in because often our confounders are related to each other as well. Um, so let's think about, I wish I had you all here to suggest some other things that might be associated with being a parent and with getting enough sleep. Um, well, the thing that's on my mind right now, since I have a toddler at home, uh, is how much you work. So the amount of work. So maybe how much you work influences whether or not you become a parent. Um, or it could even be the other way around that once you become a parent, maybe that changes how much you work. And as we probably all know, if you're working a whole lot, it can be hard to get enough sleep and do everything else you have to do. So the amount that you're working probably influences your sleep as well. Um, but how old you are can also influence how much you work. And so you can see it pretty quickly, we only have four variables here, and we're already getting a much more complicated set of arrows in between the variables. And so that's why it's not really just enough that a variable's related to both exposure and outcome to put it in our model, because we also need to think about all these other lines that might be going on between the different confounders themselves along with how they influence the exposure and the outcome. So for that reason, it's not just gonna be a matter of listing everything that you can think of that might relate to the exposure and outcome that you're looking at. We're gonna, we need to take a little bit more thoughtful approach to identifying confounders. And the approach that I'm gonna recommend, which is kind of the standard practice in epidemiology uh, these days, is to use a causal diagram and specifically, we're going to use a directed acyclic graph to decide which variable should we actually adjust for in our model. So the concept behind a causal diagram is, as the name sort of implies, is to make a diagram, a picture, kind of like I was just doing there, with all the different lines between all the different variables that have a causal influence on each other. And by that, I mean, it's not just, uh, you know, not just a correlation, it's not just that oh, these two things happen to, to coincide with each other. It's that one actually, that there's evidence from other studies ideally, or from some theoretical framework um, that you have found or created that, that one actually causes the other. Um, so keep in mind, as I said before, when you were deciding what your exposure and outcome, which one would be which in your study, remember that age and sex and other innate characteristics can cause other things like health behaviors, but health behaviors can't change you know, how old you are or whether or not you were born as a, a male or female. So remember that the, there are some things that can causally influence others. And then sometimes, again, with those innate characteristics in particular, there's no way that anything else can change those. So that'll be important when you start creating your causal diagram. Uh, there is another software program I'm going to show you that will help you with this process because it does become very uh, complicated very quickly figuring out which ones you need to adjust for. So I'm going to show you in a separate video how to use a program called Daggety. Um, the name comes from that directed acyclic graph. It's uh, abbreviated as DAG, and so the website is called Daggety. So you and your group together will come up with a causal diagram.
that explains the relationship between your exposure and outcome. And then the program will actually tell you what variables you actually you need to include in your model in order to adequately adjust for confounding. Um, let's see, that might be all I want to say for right now, because I will be doing the separate Daggety video and a video on um, how to actually run this in Stata. I guess one last thing I do want to say. The other kind of approach to building regression models that people sometimes use is what's called a stepwise approach. And that basically is using, it's relying on statistical p-values, statistical differences, to decide what you're going to adjust for. So somebody might go ahead and put in all 10 potential confounding variables they can think of, and then take them out one at a time based on whether or not they show statistical significance within the model. And there are a lot of problems with that approach. Um, I'm not going to go into them in a lot of details, but the, the primary one in my mind is that that's very dependent on your data. So remember at the very beginning we said we've collected data on a sample. We really want to know what's happening in the population. So in our case, we have you know 1,800 or so students who answered the campus wellness assessment. We really want to know not just about those 1,800 students. We're trying to apply that to the full almost 20,000 students that we have here. So we're using sample data to estimate population parameters and characteristics. And so if you're using sample data to build your regression model, depending on your sample, those relationships could be slightly different. And so you don't really want your data to be driving what you do or don't adjust for. You wanna think about at the population level, how are these variables related and so that's really what a DAG allows us to do. We're saying independent of whatever data we've actually collected, what are these relationships and therefore what should we be adjusting for? So it takes out any kind of error or bias that might result just from our sampling approach <clears throat> um, if we do a causal diagram instead of using a stepwise approach. As I said, there's a few other reasons that stepwise approaches are potentially problematic, but that's the big uh, reason that I would say, you know, based on what we've talked about so far, that's the most important reason not to use them uh, when building your models. So we won't do that in this class. Going forward, you may work with or for somebody who likes that approach, um, but for this class at least, we're going to do causal diagrams and DAGs in particular. So I will uh, post a DAG video soon and some video going through the code for how to do this regression modeling in Stata. So in the meantime, be well, uh, keep in touch, let me know if you have any questions.